This is a piece of information that every single telescope manufacturer should be giving you. It's called relative illumination, and here's why. In short, it makes your life easier, okay? The hardest, hardest thing to get right in astrophotography are flat frames. Why? Uh, well, they are kind of complicated. And you just go on the forums and stuff and just start looking for advice on flat frames. You will find immense, immense numbers of topics and just huge numbers of questions out there. People struggling with flat frames. Why? Well, because, well, they are kind of tough to do. And if they're just a little bit off, they can mess your image up quite a bit. But if you have a telescope whose relative illumination field fits the camera that you're using, then your life gets a lot easier. And in fact, flat frames may not even be needed. Now, some of you may actually even be surprised by the fact that you can image without flats. Yeah, I actually do it quite a bit. And that's be mainly because I chose sensors for my telescopes where the sensor fit the telescope. You know, in other words, the image sensor was not so big that it was outside of the illumination field or the vignette, if you will. That's an older word that we've used for a long time of that particular telescope. And as a result, it really does make astrophotography easier. It makes processing easier. And yeah, you can always go back and actually do calibration frames such as flats afterwards. Now, if you are one of those people who uses calibration frames to compensate for dust on your sensor, smack yourself, okay, kindly, <laughs> because you shouldn't be doing that. That is not what flats are for. If you have dust motes on your sensor, just clean it. Now, Olympus, now OM system, has for a very, very long time had a tradition where they actually built a vignette profile or field illumination profile into the camera. Okay? That when you put on your lens, you know, the chip in the lens told the camera what lens it was using and so forth. And so it would actually compensate for this stuff. But one of the things you'll notice while reading reviews is that occasionally a reviewer might actually mention, oh, this lens had a little bit of vignette. And that's because even these profiles aren't perfect. And that's because from one lens to the next, and maybe even one production lot of lenses to the next, you could have variations in those lenses. And so the vignette in them can also vary. So getting a vignette profile, so to speak, of your telescope to basically be matched to your exact telescope is actually really important. And in astrophotography, everything is harder. And so, yes, we have to do these things a lot of the times. A few astrophotographers that I talked to have said that they have a simple solution to this issue if they do have vignetting, and that's to simply crop the image with around 30%, which I was like, why would you do that? I just buy a smaller image sensor and that will cost you less for the camera. Also, the filters will cost less because, you know, you can buy smaller filters. So yeah, money saving tip for you there today. It's a lot of times the bigger sensor is not the way to go. So the chart is actually really easy to read. Basically on the left side would be the very center, the center point of your telescope's image circle. And then all the way on the right is just basically going out further and farther as they read. Now, typically for a 35 millimeter camera, you would need something that goes out to at least 22 millimeters, which would be a 44 millimeter image circle. Pretty easy. Now, how much vignette should you look for and what's acceptable and non-acceptable? That's actually gonna depend a little bit on what it is you're trying to image. So, if you're imaging something that really doesn't have anything around it, uh, galaxies are a really good example. Typically, the corners of the frame are pretty black, you know, just stars are there. Uh, sometimes you can get away with, you know, a, almost a 10% vignette, depending on your image quality standards. Okay? Now, if your image quality standards are higher, let's say you're starting to take more than 100 subs of a target before you're happy with it, well, then you might want to start getting yourself down to that 7, maybe even 6% range of vignette or illumination drop-off, as we might also call it. Now, for those of you that are imaging something that has nebulosity that goes all the way to the edge of the frame, which by the way, it's something that is becoming more and more often, shall we say, because, you know, cameras are just getting better and now we can really capture just everything that is in the picture, which is really cool. But anyways, for that kind of stuff, well, you might need to look at something that starts maybe at seven, 
percent or even a little bit lower, maybe in the five percent range or less. Okay. Now, if you get anything higher than that, well then you're going to have to start looking at taking flats very carefully in order to image and well, process your images nicely. And by the way, the more extreme your vignet is, the more careful you're going to have to be when you take your flats. You're going to have to be very, very precise. I typically consider a telescope, if it has more than 12% vignette, then I won't even touch it. Okay. It's, it's not something that I would even bother with. So this is kind of one of the reasons also why you may not want to just go out there and buy the biggest camera sensor that you can afford. Uh, you may find it <laughs> makes your life a lot easier to buy a smaller sensor. I know, for example, the new 585 sensor that everybody's kind of talking about, there's a mono version too now. That's a great, great sensor because it's almost idiot proof and many, many, there are very, very, very few telescopes out there that don't produce an illumination circle that is big enough for that smaller sensor, okay? Once you start getting into APS-C or even 35 millimeter sensors, well, then you, it just all gets harder, okay? And by the way, with all of astronomy, bigger is always more difficult. But thanks to this new chart, you know, you can kind of look at the size of your sensor and you know just kind of do a little bit of quick algebra math and basically kind of figure out you know what would match your telescope well and choose your gear appropriately now i think today this is actually starting to become a little more important than it was you know many years ago and that is because of the advent of these dual censored cameras or maybe i should say the reintroduction of them now these are becoming more and more popular more and more people are using them zw has come out with a bunch of them now and i've talked to other manufacturers of astrophotography cameras and every single one of them has told me that they have plans to do the same thing to roll out dual censored cameras now with a dual sensor camera, you have a tiny little sensor that is rather far out. It's actually as far out on the edge of the illumination field of your telescope as you can go. Now, I personally, you know, on my channel, I have used a lot of duos. In fact, I would never go back to another camera that wasn't a duo. And with those cameras, I have never had an issue regardless of the f-stop of the telescope. In other words, I could shoot at f11. And I could still guide. And, and the same thing with the filters. I could shoot through a three nanometer filter and I could still guide. But when I took that same filter and that same combination of sensor and stuck it behind a camera or excuse me, a telescope that had vignette or very low field illumination around the edges, well, then I had issues. So it's important for this. I was kind of the first channel that started talking about this, I think a little over two and a half, almost three years ago. I started kind of mentioning this in my reviews. And some of the other larger channels like Nico Carver and of course Trevor Jones, they've actually started talking about it too. And it's great to see that there are now two camera manufacturers out there who have actually started listing this chart in the specifications of their telescopes, at least the performance of their telescopes. And that is a really good thing for you, the consumer, because it allows you to make a more educated choice and decision. And every camera, well, every lens manufacturer, every telescope manufacturer out there really should start producing or at least giving you one of these charts of their telescope so that you can kind of get an idea of what you're getting. Because I, I kind of get tired of seeing, oh, it's got this size of an image circle, but that's the corrected field of view, which of course is very easy to make large, whereas getting a large illumination circle or field illumination and getting that bigger, that, that is more difficult. And you'll notice too, I'm kind of jumping around in different words and so forth. You know, the linguist in me here loves, loves this kind of stuff. And that's because we haven't kind of really standardized what terminology to use. So you're going to hear consumer camera manufacturers kind of use one set of phrases. And you're going to hear astronomy people using other sets of phrases. And I'm actually kind of cool with both, but you know, they both have their purposes. But linguist aside, sharp star and very soon uh, Topetech, who's coming out with their own telescope soon, they are starting to produce and give you these field illumination charts, which I certainly champion these guys for doing that. And I hope that other manufacturers out there start to pick up on this because it really is an important thing. So two last things. One, bigger telescopes usually have a bigger image circle, 
or illumination field. That's kind of a general rule. The smaller telescopes that we see, often they are accomplishing a larger image circle or illumination plane by using different formulas and so forth that are kind of out of standard. And in other words, you're not using a simple triplet design. A lot of them are opting for these five element Petzval designs, which those in general produce a larger image in circle. And yes, optics do have to get more complicated in order for image circles to get larger or illumination circles. So one last thing. Share this video with people that you know who are maybe in the industry of making telescopes or even making cameras. I know the Japanese are terrible about this. They don't like to be forthright and kind of like open about their products in every single aspect. We kind of have to wrestle this stuff from them. And yeah, they need to be, you know, we as customers, we love to reward candor from a company. When a company just, you know, says, oh, you want to know this about us? Here you go. We love to reward that because it makes us feel confident that they feel confident. And if you're constantly trying to hold on to information and you don't want to tell people information about your equipment, you know, or the stuff that you do, well then that just immediately makes us suspicious. 